Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, for joining us. I'm Sean Needham, and I'm, right, I'm the author of the book, Sicken, How the Government Ruined Healthcare and How to Fix It. During the research of my book, um, I noticed an interview. I ran across an interview from John Stossel from 2013, and I actually remember watching that um, video um, years ago and thinking how intrigued me. And the interview was about Dr. Keith Smith, who we have on today, the founder of the Oklahoma Surgery Center. And what made the most profound impression was the fact that Dr. Smith not only decided to disrupt the current healthcare system with price transparency, but he actually took action including included posts and pricing online. And at the time, I was interested in this and kind of following this in, in healthcare. Thought that this was a big solution to part of, part of the uh, expensive healthcare problem. So before we dive in, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Smith, and thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be with you. So my first question is, there's always, there's always some kind of trigger or event. What, what is the event that, or catalyst that made you think about opening the Oklahoma Surgery Center? Oh, I think it, there wasn't any particular special thing. Um, I was I was being boxed in in a lot of ways, and uh, the the hospitals where I worked were were kind of boxing us in. The insurance companies were boxing us in, paying us less and less every every month. Uh, the government was boxing us in, um, paying us less and less uh, every month, and I. And then uh, there was a group of uh, doctors that I was working with that initially were were very very free market, uh, and they they began to um, embrace more socialistic uh, income sharing um, thoughts. So there were a lot of pressures, uh, and then in the midst of all this, we we could clearly uh, see that we were having increasing difficulty. Uh, securing what we needed to provide care from the hospitals. Uh, the surgeons had more and more difficulty every week, every month, uh, getting the supplies they need to take care of patients. And the number of nurses on the floor was dwindling. Um, it, you know, back in the old days, you'd go down to the medical records uh, room and you could look on the right side of the chart. That was all the clinical information. And on the left side of the chart was all the financial information. You could see that patients were uh, clearly uh, being taken advantage of. So all those things together, it became clear that in order to to escape and, and basically secede uh, from this cesspool we had gotten involved with and, and in which we felt, we really felt like accessories to, to a crime. That the only way to get out of it was to really own and control our own facility uh, because that's by and large, where all of the uh, institutional uh, abuses come from, uh, financially and medically. So we, all of those things kind of came together, and I, I had had my eye on a surgery center that was very dysfunctional, that was operated by a large national corporation, and it was obviously failing um, in a long series of failed efforts to purchase this center um, over a five-year period. And, and I just wouldn't give up. And I uh, finally was able to um, to get control of this surgery center and a deal made on a hunting trip. And, and that that's another whole story in itself. So, so there were multiple factors that that really pushed uh, pushed me to to want to have control over the facility where I worked, um, both both for the quality of care that could be delivered and uh, financially the, the extent to which we could act as advocates for the patients. Now, can you mention about, um, there was a Harvard study that came out about uh, reimbursement for, for, for doctors and um, kind of like for their procedures and things. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'm not aware of a specific study on I know that physician reimbursement has been flat uh, for many years. If anything, it has it has decreased, and all the while the the reimbursement salaries of big uh, hospital CEOs has has done nothing but increase. And the number of 
the number of CEOs um, and the number of administrative staff uh, compared to physician staff is just it's exploded. But a physician payment has by and large been pretty flat. Uh, as an anesthesiologist, I can tell you physician payment has been has has fallen uh, over time. And and that's not an inflation adjusted numbers. Those are real numbers. And most most anesthesiologists I know are not making and nearly uh, the kind of revenue that they were making uh, 20 years ago. And a lot of people would say we were overpaid 20 years ago. I, I would say, I would say that anesthesiologists as a group are probably uh, not paid enough. I mean, particularly those that are taking care of patients that are uh, enrolled in government programs. These, these positions, it's called cardiac anesthesiologists, many times require subsidies uh, from the facilities that are doing very well uh, because they, they simply cannot attract uh, someone to, to a field that is primarily paid for by one of these uh, schemes that rations with uh, low pricing. Now, you, you've mentioned before that certain physicians got hurt the worst back when you decided to open the Oklahoma Surgery Center, and I think it was radiologists, anesthesiologists, pathologists and ER doctors. Can you explain that a little bit? And there's some kind of reimbursement model tied to that? Yes, in uh, I believe it was 1992, uh, Harvard gave birth to what I call the Rosemary's Baby of healthcare, the resource-based relative value scale, where uh, it's just uh, uh, central planning at its finest, uh, where a, a group got together and decide, decided that they knew uh, how much services uh, that physicians offer uh, should be, how, how they should be compensated. So this resource-based relative value scale came out and, and they decided first to victimize hospital-based doctors, radiologists, anesthesiologists, pathologists, and ER doctors, and, and victimize them because most of those doctors had no, had no way to escape. They had no way to secede. Uh, they were trapped uh, and and to some extent, the hospitals where they worked uh, were their customer, and they had to continue to provide these services no matter what they were paid. And I think Medicare knew this, and I think the folks at Harvard knew this. And um, the other, the other uh, specialists were not far behind um, being victimized by this RV, RBS system. And, and it was a complete failure to understand that um, prices, true prices, emerge uh, from a competitive market. They're never accurately imposed uh, on a market or, or on a group of uh, service providers. If, if you decide you're going to inflict pricing on people, you're always going to be wrong. You're either going to be too high or too low. And, and indeed, that's what, that's what happened. So many of the prices that were inflicted on the physicians were, were too low and it created predictable shortages. And to give you an example, uh, the last cardiac anesthetic uh, that I provided, uh, I was paid uh, $285, and, and that was for a six-hour procedure. Before RBRVS uh, Part 1, uh, I was paid about $1,000, about $1,100 to do an anesthetic for a cardiac procedure. Round 1 of RBRVS uh, cut that in half, and then round 2 cut it in half again. So, so the last... Last cardiac anesthetic, I was paid uh, $285. The last anesthesia I gave for a knee replacement, I was paid $78 by Medicare. So these, I mean, even anybody with any common sense can tell you that $78 is, prior to paying overhead and taxes, is not nearly enough money uh, to, to, you know, get somebody to get out of bed and, and want to do those procedures. So uh, the, the ability of orthopedic surgeons who also were victimized, their ability to find uh, adequate anesthesia to cover these cases was, was very limited and, and continues to be. So this, um, this pricing that was inflicted was, was very, very low. On the other hand, there were some prices that were uh, thrown out there that are, that are too high. And so you have predictable surpluses. You know, there are some procedures and activities that uh, physicians and hospitals are involved with where they're paid way too much money. And so you get a whole bunch of that. 
and you know that which is paid below a market rate you have shortages of those things and Ludwig von Mises said that which you tax you destroy and that which you subsidize proliferates and it's the same with price controls and the government can never get anything wrong no that's right so so speaking of free market what trends have you noticed in the healthcare industry as in regards to the free market uh, fortunately, and the reason I am so filled with optimism is the free market is really getting a hold. Um, there, there is a huge movement. Uh, I think a manifestation of which is the Free Market Medical Association. It's, it's a nationwide movement to to really uh, demonstrate the power of markets uh, and the beauty of markets too. That transparent pricing is possible. Uh, that many. Uh, procedures and services that are provided can basically be commoditized and and for the very very small number of um, patient situations and encounters that cannot have a known upfront price attached and the insurance plays its proper role and you know insurance is for uncertainty it's it's not for your oil change you know in, insurance is it really should not even be for your hernia repair or your colonoscopy. These are, these are procedures that the price for which scares people now, but thanks to the market, the price is crashing. And, and as competition usually does, it, it's also increasing the quality. So the, the trend of the free market, I think, is growing uh, in the medical industry. It's a very exciting and very wonderful trend. But it's a very scary and very creepy trend for the entrenched cronies that that have bought all these favors from uh, the goons in D.C. So speaking of D.C., what's your opinion on the federal government fixing health care? Well, yeah, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you applies to health care as it does in everything else. Uh, they can never get anything right. Uh, thank God they can never get anything right. They uh, even with Obamacare. Uh, they couldn't get it right. Uh, as a favor to the large insurance carriers, they they foisted all these gigantic deductibles uh, on uh, individuals in the United States. And it basically created a consumer market. Uh, so even the government can't even get tyranny right. You know, usually they're, they're really good at stealing from us and starting wars and shooting us and killing others. And they can't even get, they can't even get this right, this Obamacare thing. So when you've got a seven or eight or ten thousand dollar family deductible, suddenly you're a shopper. Uh, you have sticker shock. You care what your colonoscopy or your hernia repair cost. And there are countless patients that come to my facility who who walk in and and pay the bill and pay the entire surgery for what a what a fraction of their deductible is. So very inadvertently and and um, unintended a very unintended consequence of a favor uh, that Obamacare was meant to hand to the insurance carriers to subsidize them. Very unintended consequences. They basically uh, created a consumer market full of shoppers, people that are asking, you know, how much? You know, when, it, when it, you're spending your money, you want to know how much is this? And, and the person that receives that question or the hospital or the surgeon or whoever when they hear a patient say, how much is this? Uh, they become very anxious, uh, partly because they don't know, uh, or partly because they don't want to say, because they want to ensure they can get all the money they can out of the exchange. But they also know that if they get that question wrong, in all likelihood, the person that asked that topic question is going to march down the street to their competitor and ask them the very same question and if they get an answer, and if they get a good answer, they know they will have lost that business. So this is this is very exciting. You know, the market is in competition is a wonderful thing, and and I think people that did not think they would ever face that question are having to learn how to answer it. And otherwise, they're being victimized by, by those of us who not only have answered that question but have put all of our answers online. I mean, you don't you don't even have to ask uh, at our facility. And fortunately, that trend is growing. So, what are what are some of the what are some of the answers that you have on fixing healthcare? Well, the the first uh, answer that I would give is an admonition. It's very cautionary. Uh, the last place people should look is is to the outfit that has created this mess, uh, and and that's the federal government. 
So while while a lot of people are are correct in blaming uh, big insurance companies, uh, big hospital systems, all the cronies who benefit from this disaster, they have to understand, they really have to remember that Uncle Sam is driving the getaway car. This is all a scam uh, that that has been uh, has become what it is because of favors that have been auctioned off in Washington, D.C. So uh, I find it very illogical and ironic that that people who think that the United States healthcare system is a mess, I would be one of those people. I would agree with that. But many of them would turn to the very organization that has created this mess to save us from it. And I find that very ironic, very illogical. Uh, the idea that uh, the folks who came up with Medicare uh, should be, and Medicare for all, and that, the, that these people should be trusted uh, with, with the entire system. When, when everything that we think about the healthcare system that is wrong is, is a manifestation of their eff- efforts, whether it's sporadic quality, uh, whether it's high pricing, uh, whether it's a runaway you know, insurance premiums, extremely high deductibles, uh, the inability for individuals to purchase care or coverage with pre-tax dollars the way businesses do. These are all favors that have been passed out uh, by both sides of the aisle. Both sides of the aisle have blood on their hands in this mess. And uh, I think the last person I want to turn the keys over to is the person that's been robbing me and victimizing me for decades. What do you you think are some common misconceptions with you know the the free market healthcare versus government healthcare. What what are some where do a lot of people have questions or or misconceptions? Well, first of all, um, I would caution people that would think that the current health system in its mess is a failure of the free market. Um, the reason it's a mess is there's a relative absence of the free market. I mean, you see the free market at work in LASIK surgery and plastic surgery where there's a cash market. Um, Even in the bariatric surgery market, you see an active cash market there. And the prices have done nothing but fall and the quality has done nothing but soar. And that's that's the free market at work, what Rothbard called the power and the beauty of the market. And you see it at work. So I, I would first caution people to not blame the free market for the mess we have. It's, it's the federal government that's to blame. And the federal government is the opposite of the free market. I mean, every, every intervention that they undertake is, um, it just it creates a mess. And there are a lot of misconceptions about the market. You know, if we allow, you know, the market to work, people will die in the streets. And, you know, you can't purchase care from an ambulance. You know, there's, how are you going to how are you going to choose, you know, your care if you're in an ambulance? And um, some of these some of these arguments can be addressed with uh, with just the idea of timing. So um, our reputation at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma is very strong. If if we victimized vulnerable people, our reputation would be destroyed. And that's the market at work. If if you're in an ambulance. Um, and you're headed to a hospital, and you're completely vulnerable, and that hospital brutalizes you financially and takes advantage of you in a vulnerable state, then the reputation should, in a free market, suffer as a result, and there would be uh, horrendous consequences. I, I tell people that a, that a restaurant that serves poisonous food will be put out of, uh, put out of business by the market much quicker uh, than it will by some state health department. I mean, the government, you know, the health department is tough. You know, everybody thinks, oh, my gosh, here comes the health department. The market is completely unforgiving. Uh, that, that, even that, that building where that restaurant is uh, might never see another restaurant survive if that happens. So if you allow the market to work, it will deliver consequences to those who brutalize the vulnerable. The other thing uh, people often ask, you know, if you let the free market work, well, what about the poor? And and I I caution them: if you want to think about the poor, you must think about them in individuals uh, as individuals. Uh, it's not fair to the poor, I think, to consider them as a group. I think that's a very dangerous and slippery slope to consider 
groups of people and what is best for groups of people. I think that, that we have to consider what is what is right for the individual. And consistent with that, I think that what the question, what about the poor is a very local issue. Uh, if you if you consider the poor in the aggregate, then you are inviting some final solution to be inflicted on them. Uh, and that's what that's what Medicaid looks like. You know, if you live, if you look at the study that was done in Oregon, your your likelihood of having a reason a better health outcome, and um, it was higher if you were uninsured than if you had Medicaid. And of course, part of the reason for that is the price controls inflicted on on the physicians. Very few physicians want to actually see Medicaid patients, so many of them don't have a doctor, and that's why they end up in the emergency room and is receiving. Uh, substandard care from from someone that has never seen them before and probably will never see them again. So the, the what about the poor question, uh, we have to be careful. If we are going to consider the poor in the aggregate, then we have to consider the bounty uh, that is created by the free market in the aggregate. So to the extent that you are not bankrupted for your hernia surgery, then uh, Instead of paying thirty thousand, let's say you decide to come to Surgery Center of Oklahoma and pay three thousand, you are uh, you are twenty seven thousand dollars enriched uh, by that decision, and so you have to consider the bounty in the aggregate as well. I mean, how many people not bankrupted by their care are now better empowered to take care of their very poor, destitute neighbor who who might need their care, and I. I, my my response too to the question, what about the poor, is to ask a question back. And whoever asked me that, so what are your intentions? You know, I'll tell you mine. You go first. As a physician, and every physician I know, we are happy to donate our time and services uh, to the extent that we can. But typically, the people that ask that question are not ready to step up and help cover the cost of the supplies, for instance, to perform some procedure or, or to deliver some care. So I think we have to think about the, uh, the poor uh, as individuals. I think we all should help in this effort together. I think it should be charitable. I think the poor deserve better than what the completely corrupt machine in DC would inflict on them. And, and, and I think that the care that they would receive uh, would be a far better quality and, and we would all be better off. So on that same kind of note, there's always a, a topic that comes up about pre-existing conditions. Um, do you have any comment on that? Well, pre-existing conditions is a very, very highly charged and emotional issue because, because the price that people actually pay for care is so high. If the prices were reasonable, this would not be nearly the issue that it is. So the fear uh, that is created from ridiculous and bankrupting pricing is really what should be our focus. So I, I tell people, you know, we, we, have to, we have to make sure we focus on the real problem, and that's the price. It's not coverage. Uh, this whole pre-existing condition thing is a distraction that pulls us down into that black hole of, oh my gosh, I have to have health coverage. And of course, that is exactly what the carriers want. And they've worked very hard to generate this fear uh, that drives people right into their bosom to buy this ridiculous coverage. So the pre-existing condition uh, issue, it's an issue, but it, is, uh, it, it should also be subject to the market. I should be able to buy uh, an insurance policy that does not cover pre-existing conditions if I choose. I also should be able to buy a policy that does cover pre-existing conditions if the market will provide one. So I don't know why any of us should be forced uh, to buy a product or service uh, that we otherwise would not buy. And imagine, imagine that you are selling a product or service, the purchase of which is mandatory. And that's a that's a serious money maker, and that's why uh, when Obamacare passed, you saw all of these um, publicly traded um, insurance company stocks go through the roof. So the, the pre-existing condition is 
is is an issue the way the way a lot of um the way a lot of entities deal with that like the cost sharing ministries is they'll put somebody on a pre-existing condition hold for two years and then after paying premiums for two years then then some of them uh, with some limits cover that but if you if you allow someone to buy insurance after their home catches fire you, you're going to ensure that very few others can afford to buy that coverage uh, because it's it's actually not insurance then where it is covering uncertainty and it is it's a prepaid prepaid care so you you mentioned at at the first of our interview about you know you felt one of the reasons you wanted to get out was because you felt like you were perpetuating the problem um so did you get a pushback from a lot of your colleagues and is that getting better or worse now? Yeah, I, I've had pushback from the beginning. Um, when I decided in 1993 uh, that I was no longer going to accept money from the federal government, uh, I, I got a lot of pushback from that. I, I didn't stop uh, caring for Medicare patients. I just, I just didn't accept the money. I, I, uh, I have, problem with that. I, I realized that um, my neighbor was paying me uh, for care. I was rendering to someone across town that my neighbor didn't even know. And, and the person across town to whom I was providing this care could probably afford it. So the, these decisions that I've made, that, that I've made trying to be consistent with um, my philosophy and, and my thoughts about how we all ought to live, not at the expense of others. I, the, these thoughts have um, gotten me a lot of attention. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. Uh, my colleagues, I think um, many times, many, many years ago, thought that I was way out on the edge. And of course, there, there are many of them that have come, come around and have, uh, just put their head down and, and he even stooped to call me a visionary uh, because I, I, I just thought people, people should not be bankrupted for the care they receive. I thought they ought to know how much they're paying for it up front. And, and I, I didn't think that you know, we should, we should live at the expense of others uh, unless it's charitable and, and I celebrate volunteerism. So, um, there are people that that have had real issues with what we've done some of them and and with with my business model and how I think some of them have come around because they see like I do that it really is just a manifestation of the golden rule it's just doing the right thing and how how we all should live some people have come around because the market has pressured them and that's what the market does and you can you can take a somebody who maybe does not agree with my views, but that they've been victimized by the Surgery Center of Oklahoma's online pricing, and they're actually losing business to us, then they suddenly have this epiphany where, well, maybe that's the way to go. So, you know, that, that's, again, that's the beauty and the power of the market is, is you, don't, uh, you don't count on the benevolence of someone so much as in that actually acting in their self-interest to provide you know, what customers need and at a price they can afford. So give me two of your most compelling stories that you have from the Oklahoma Surgery Center where you have made the biggest difference in someone's life um, and not necessarily just pricing, but that's obviously probably gonna be involved. Yeah, we, we have a contract at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma with uh, employers uh, now in all 50 states. These are companies that are self-funded or self-insured. So they've told all the carriers to go jump in a lake and they, and they assume the risk themselves. So the, these are companies that pay for their employees care out of operation, operational revenue uh, rather, than, rather than have a big insurance carrier take the risk. One, one of the companies, one of the entities with which we have an agreement is, is Oklahoma County. Oklahoma County is the largest county in Oklahoma and uh, in, in the middle of which sits Oklahoma City, and and they have a lot of employees, uh, and none of them are what you and I would uh, characterize as highly compensated. So the agreement is this: if if the employees of Oklahoma County come to Surgery Center of Oklahoma for the surgery they need or the children need, 
the entire bill is paid by the by Oklahoma County. There's no copay. There's no deductible. And so, you know, in December, it, it's not uncommon, and this has happened many times now for several years, for a parent to tell us, you know, our child, number one, is having their tonsils out because we don't have this deductible hurdle over which, you know, we can't climb. And we're going to have Christmas this year because we don't have to come up with all of the deductible and copay to cover, you know, this tonsillectomy or whatever it is that we're doing. So these are these are life changing uh, experiences for these people where you know, families can can receive the care that they need and not be uh, financially burdened. In in the meantime, Oklahoma County saves millions of dollars by dealing with us uh, instead of one of the price gouging so called not for profit hospitals that that would otherwise uh, just wreak havoc on this self funded plan. And um, there are many uh, many. Uh, individual stories. One of my favorites, we had a we had a patient from Georgia reach out to us and they needed a, a urologic procedure and they'd been quoted $40,000 by a local hospital in Georgia. And it was for a procedure listed on our website for $3,600. So they uh, they decided they were going to come uh, to the to the surgery center but they they wanted to let their let their surgeon know. It just so happens this surgeon had lost another patient to us a couple of months before, and he said, "No, no, no, we're <laughs> we're going to go talk to the hospital first because this this is going to get out of control." So, he went over to the hospital and you know had a printout of my pricing and said, "You know, you quoted forty, there are thirty six hundred. I'm going to lose another patient to to these guys in Oklahoma. You know, we got to do something." So the hospital agreed to perform their part of the procedure for $4,000. So this patient reached out to me and he said, you, you realize you saved me $36,000 and you didn't even perform the procedure. And that's the market at work. And this is life changing for this person. It's, it's like Bastiat's question, you know, what is not seen? And I like to think, you know, what, what did this guy do with the $36,000 he didn't spend? Uh, to actually uh, secure this procedure. Uh, there, there are countless stories. There, there are far too many uh, to, to tell. It, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. It's been very gratifying on my end. All of the staff that work at my facility are part of, part of a huge uh, effort that they know is truly changing people's lives and, and not just in a, in a medical way. So you mentioned a story to me one time about a, a gal from Canada seeking a hysterectomy. Can you elaborate on that story? Yeah, so when we, when we put our prices online a little over 10 years ago, uh, it's educational, I think, instructional for people to know the first patients that arrived were Canadians. You know, they, they have coverage up there. They just don't have access to the care many of them require. And I think that's a good reminder for people to focus on the price. This is about this is about the delivery of care and the price, and coverage should be an afterthought. And as it was, you know, before the government got, you know, so involved and and ruined things. So uh, the first Canadians that arrived were um, you know the people who who were waiting in line, uh, and and the most common story was was a female that had dysfunctional and painful uterine bleeding that was in a three year waiting line for a hysterectomy and, and getting tired of receiving transfusions. So they found our price online, it's $8,000 that covers surgeon anesthesia facility pathology and a night overnight stay in our facility. And they come down from Canada and have their hysterectomy and do well and go back home. And that, that, remains the most common story. Uh, for some reason, there is not a not an adequate number of uh, gynecologists or, or this care available uh, in Canada. Uh, so when you have a socialized system like that, uh, you have this rationing and people pay with their time. Uh, it's important to understand that our time is valuable and if you're told you have to wait three years uh, to to receive some relief from some crippling uh, issue, that is a price people pay, and people pay with their time, not just with their money. And so the, you know, the rationing that occurs um, in a government program is is brutal. 
uh, and, and they're not they're not alone in Canada. The free market also rations uh, by price. So let's be honest. I mean, the, the the free market rations with pricing. The beautiful thing about the market is the market ensures that resources are used in the most efficient way. And so if you have an incredibly efficient use of resources, you actually have less rationing. More people can gain access to care at a reasonable price uh, than you can if some bureaucrat uh, is deciding, okay, well, we've, we've got to do more total knees this month because people are raising hell and the line's getting too long. Let's ignore all the people that need hysterectomies for a little bit till we catch up. That's exactly how it works in Canada. But I, I would caution anyone that it's having a conversation with a Canadian. Don't don't say anything negative about their healthcare system because in spite of its having just grossly failed, and uh, they're incredibly proud of it. Now uh, it's the same case in the UK. Uh, the people in England are, and uh, it's like this nationalistic pride uh, that they have in their socialized medicine, uh, even though it, it's failed them miserably. So fantastic. Um, I, I'd like to thank you for taking the time with me today. Um, you know, for, for all you listeners out there, um, go to Facebook, follow Oklahoma Surgery Center on Facebook, um, the Free Market Medical Association. They've got great posts every day. Follow them. Um, it, all this stuff, just they really, really dive into it more and you get more details and more articles about it. And um, that's it for today. I thank you again, Dr. Smith, for, for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.